So off the coast of Japan is this thing called the Unaguni Monument. Basically, if you put on snorkeling gear and have a fun time around this area, go deep enough and you're gonna find it. And you might be kind of confused. This thing is so orderly in what is clearly identifiable as carved steps and organized patterns of stone. It's quite clear that it's a remnant of a civilization long past. The problem is, with how deep it is underwater, this thing would have to be over 10,000 years old, constructed during the last ice age to have been built when the ocean was at such an altitude. Because we have never been able to identify a civilization so old, capable of chiseling rock in such a manner, the scientific communities of geology and history are convinced that this place formed naturally. When looking at it, you might think that's impossible, and I agree with that intuition. What exactly is going on in Japan? The easiest way to solve these historical mysteries would, naturally, be to build the Earth in Minecraft. And so we have a team that's been working on exactly that, since both urban, suburban, and rural Japanese architecture contains designs not seen anywhere else in the world, the buildings themselves having more shape and artistry than the efficiency of the West on display in places like New York, it would be an equally challenging and rewarding experience. Well, we've been at it for four years, and I'm gonna pull the curtain on one of the most sanguine, curious, peaceful, and beautiful cultures and land the world has ever seen, and all of its mysteries. This is everything Japan has ever done. First off, Tokyo, largest city in the country and the economic and population epicenter of Japan. Progress is extensive at the Shibuya Crossing, and for those of you who don't know what this is, it's the busiest pedestrian crossing intersection in the world. They estimate as much as 3,000 people cross the street every green light, which is a two minute cycle. They estimate the busiest days have as many as half a million people crossing this intersection. And here's the weirdest part. It apparently diminishes in volume almost not at all past midnight in the twilight hours. What the heck are people still doing up? They're not coming home from Tinder dates, since Japanese young adults are now poised to be the most asexual group of people in history and continues to increase. Is it Pokemon Go? Cocaine? Both? Now you can see by the architecture. Japanese urban living is quite unlike anything you've ever seen. The lights, billboards, and skyscraper stylings are wholly unique to their culture, with the crossing itself being featured in various movies over the years including Lost in Translation, Fast and Furious, and Resident Evil. Also in Tokyo, they've made insane progress on Shinjuku Station and the surrounding skyscrapers. The skyscrapers with the craziest shapes are among my favorite when viewing it recreated in Minecraft, but Shinjuku station itself is so massive, it services almost 4 million passengers daily, making it by far the world's busiest transport center of any kind and is in the Guinness Book of World Records for being so. Tokyo has come a long way from just being a little fishing village 150 years ago. Just kidding. Tokyo went by the name of Edo back then, but the population was over 1 million by that time since the current shogun decided to make it the basis of his rule. In 1869, after the defeat of the Edo shogunate, they renamed Edo Tokyo. The emperor moved there and it became the nation's capital. The rest is literally history. Team Japan has built the Itsukushima Shrine on Itsukushima Island, a sacred island where no death or births are allowed to take place. Despite this, one battle, historically, has taken place on the island, the Battle of Miyajima in 1555. The defenders, upon realizing their defeat and finding no way to escape the island, ended up committing seppuku a Japanese ritualistic form of suicide. When the battle was over, to restore the sacred nature to the island, they removed those fallen in the battle, scrubbed every building of every drop of blood, even removed all blood-tainted sand from the island in order to erase the presence of death. The island and its shrine is also well known for its blooming cherry blossoms in the upper hillside and maple leaf trees in autumn. Next to the shrine is the Daiganji Temple, not yet complete. The Buddhist goddess it's built for can be traced in its lineage back to Hindu deities from India. Today, the various temples are open to the public only one day a year on June 17th. Progress has also began in Sutenkaku the tower reaching heaven and its surrounding streets. The fully detailed street leading up to it looks absolutely gorgeous in detailing. This tower is not the original Tsutsenkaku. The original was built 
to be basically if the Eiffel Tower and the Arc de Triomphe had sexual intercourse. I want you to focus on the mental image of that for a moment, and ended up having a child. Unfortunately, that child burned to death in a fire in 1943, but though it was only damaged, not destroyed, the Japanese still decided to scrap its metal for use in the war. Fifteen years later, they reopened the area with a second brand new tower reaching heaven. The tower has been laced with colorful lights decades before RGB game room decorations were ever a thing. Neon lights in the 70s now replaced with LEDs. What's really cool about these lights historically is they change depending on the season of the year. For example, when the cherry blossoms of Japan are in full bloom, they change to the color pink during March and April to match. On the fifth floor of the observation deck is enshrined Billiken, the god of happiness. Each year, thousands of visitors place a coin in his donation box and rub the scales of his feet to make their wishes come true. Here we have a nearly fully complete Japanese island, Ninoshima. The island's name meaning Resemblance Island, as the shape of the island looks like Mount Fuji. Near the turn of the 19th century, the island was used as a quarantine center during the Sino-Japanese War, a conflict between Imperial Japan and the Qing Dynasty of China. Japan smoked them due to having successfully modernized their military, whereas China did not. During World War I, they built internment camps to house the German prisoners of war. Ninoshima was just outside the blast zone of the atomic bomb hitting Hiroshima in World War II, so Ninoshima Island served as a quarantine site where they shipped thousands and thousands of radioactive terminal citizens to ultimately just suffer and perish. Decades later in 1971, when they had built a junior high and high school on the island, mass graves of over 500 victims of the event were unearthed. Here's an area of completed progress in Aikawa, Kanagawa, a beautiful town located in the foothills of Kanto. They had some epic battles of history in these locations, and population was steadily growing until the year 2000 and had been declining for the last 20 years. Whoa. Okay, I'm checking everywhere, and the same thing has been happening. Since the 90s, Japan has basically been entering insufficient population replacement territory. Okay, so the rate at which to maintain a population is for two parents to have two kids. So a rate of two. Makes sense. Japan's almost down to 1.2. The only city that saw substantial growth in the population is Tokyo. And that's mostly because young people from cities and towns throughout the country go there to pursue the job opportunities. And foreigners flying to and living in Tokyo for the same reason. It's it's estimated that Japan's population could fall from the current 125 million down all the way to 75 million by the year 2100. If we extrapolate this rate as linear, the native Japanese people will become completely extinct by the year 2225. An entire population demographic, the birthplace of anime, gone. Okay, so there's a really interesting thing going on here. There's a mixture of a bigger problem that is just facing modern, free, first world society in general, and then struggles and phenomena that are unique to Japanese culture. So there's something called omiyal, which is a long-standing Japanese tradition, historically used both to allow people to find suitable marriages and for families to join together for mutual alliances. The Western equivalent would be in medieval Europe with arranged marriages. Now, modern Western media in movies about these time periods always paint out the parents or kings and queens arranging the marriages to be the bad guys and the people being arranged just absolutely absolutely hated it. Just hated it. But in Japan, the omiyal tradition was in context with the nation's character and a somewhat fairer process. Through matchmaking, two families would present the members of the possible match for a possible marriage. This would first be determined by ascertaining the respective members' character through word of friends, family, even investigating the local community where the family lived to determine the character of the person being matched. If this phase of the character revealing was found agreeable, it was suggested by the families that they spend time alone socializing to determine if they're a good match, and things move from there. They even feature part of this process in the beginning of the Disney movie Mulan. Now, historically, this practice may have been more forced than organic when two families had a highly vested interest to join, and for those reasons, I initially reacted against it when reading all of this. But then I thought about my life and the spontaneity of Western romance and its upsides and its downsides. Here's a major downside. When you first meet a person, you don't actually know them. If they have a vested interest to pair with you, 
They're usually aware of their serious faults and may actually hide them from you for as long as possible until it's too late. This can do serious damage to your life. But formalizing this process into a mutual interview where the culmination of your lifelong habits and characteristics are revealed by your friends, family, and neighboring witnesses mitigates for the anonymity you get with spontaneous love here in the West. That's pretty genius, and it's why this tradition persisted for centuries. And even after World War II ended, the practice was not abandoned, but transformed. But as soon as we get closer to the modern era, that number got lower and lower as Japanese became susceptible to Western ideas in the modern era, and now Omiyal is responsible for less than 7% of Japanese marriages. This is actually interesting because Japanese culture is very closed, not just to foreign involvement, but with each other. In Seattle, we have this term called the Seattle Freeze, which basically describes this social attitude where strangers talking to each other is very, very rare and almost kind of a social no-no. Now, when you do strike up the courage to talk to a stranger, very often they can be very glad that you did, and for a moment we escape the Seattle Freeze. In the United States, this is very different everywhere else, especially the South. Strangers striking up conversation is a constant spontaneous event that you will see and possibly participate in every day, but not in Seattle. But at least in Seattle, when people do manage to get to talk to new people, they are excited about it. In Japan, they don't encourage it, they don't want it, it is discouraged. If Seattle is a freeze, then Japan would literally be sub-zero. So much so that for most Japanese, their closest friends are still the people they grew up with in school, almost all of the time. Social planning is very methodical, always planned, sometimes months in advance, and socializing at someone else's home is a very, very rare event in comparison to how much of a staple this is in the USA. This combined with a larger problem that's forming in the modern world societies where people often prefer their own free time dedicated to their interests and choice of whatever in comparison to starting a family is the reason why young adults in Japan aged 18 to 39 are the most single generation of Japanese ever. A staggering 70% of Japanese men opting not to even make an attempt at dating. But if this continues, there's going to be no Japanese. Their population will just have to be entirely replaced by foreigners. And that's everything Team Japan has created in Minecraft with a momentary segue into what I found to be a very interesting topic. Cultural evolution is really interesting. You can map it out into world history, and what you have is an evolving quilt of different human patterns that is continually developing and changing, converging here, something dying off there, a clash between two of them here. There are plenty of examples of isolated cultures throughout history, but Japan being closed off as a series of islands is one of the few isolatory cultures who are actually powerful enough to attempt world domination. And without the United States to counter that force, they would have gotten a lot closer to achieving it. This historic isolation has given us such a unique area that, since the ending of its isolation in the 1860s, has influenced the world stage in every subsequent epoch that we've experienced. But there may come a day when building Japan's incredible architecture in Minecraft that we've seen over the duration of this video, that source material may come to an end if there are no more Japanese to build another incredible temple, or a house, or a shrine.